Welcome to the Salmon's Corner Podcast. I am your host, Daniel Roberts. Jesus famously said, a house divided cannot stand. And I have lost my script. Hold on. The recent de- divisions within the Christian conservatives demonstrating th- are demonstrating this fact. Morally, socially, and spiritually, Christians are dividing over everything. Ted Cruz comes out in favor of IVF and Daily Wire drama continues. But the question is not, is Christ king? The question is, where is his kingdom? We analyze American philosopher Alexis de Tocqueville and his prescient thoughts on the matter. I'm Daniel Roberts, and this is the Solomon's Corner Podcast, a place for thinkers. Welcome to the Solomon's Corner Podcast, a place for thinkers. Join us as we explore the depths of theology, philosophy, and the Christian intellectual life. Welcome to the show. Um, I've got a mug, Maximilian Colby mug. We've got more coming in. So if you like uh, saints and thinkers, make sure you check out my Substack. You can uh, subscribe there. We're going to be making an announcement when the e-store drops. Just go to solomonscorner.com. You can check it out. Um, We're going to be doing a uh, pretty casual show tonight, Um, obviously, because it's super late. Drop a comment if you have questions. Uh, We also have our first listener question, so that's an exciting thing. Um, But the main points that I want to talk about today, because of all the stuff that's been going on, there is an interesting uh, connection point between history and our current moment, which, you know, is the case at every moment. But um, it's really coming to the fore today um, in this past week. The main thing is that moral divisions are, are spiritual divisions. That's the first thing, um, that Christians are losing their political representation, and I'll explain why. Um, they, they are becoming uh, less valuable to politicians, and even though they're all using the words Christian and all this kind of stuff, whether it's Trump or whether it's DeSantis, what it means to be a Christian is not what you and I think it means. To them... We are just another constituency that they need to represent in order to maintain political power. Nothing against them for that approach. That's politics. Get it. But part of the reason why that's the case is because Christians are not united on anything. And the research bears this out. Compared to Republicans and Democrats, we are not united at all. Like the Democrats are almost like united in a way that makes them almost monolithic. Um, and the Demo- the Republicans are not. And this is largely, I think, due to our denominational differences. I think that's a big part of it. Uh, You tell me what you think, though. Let me know in the comments. Why do you think that we are losing political uh, capital? Um, The last thing is, is that is there a revival, though? And I think that there is a revival. I personally think it's a Catholic revival, even though I know the stats don't necessarily bear that out. There's all these nuns and things like N-O-N-S-E-S, not the N-U-N-S. But I do think that there is more of a catholic revival happening i just had another friend reach out to me uh one of my followers telling me that you know they've uh suddenly decided to become catholic after years and years away from the church a lot of reversions happening and you know uh i I just think that that is uh is happening and we'll look at that as well um because i don't think it's just people reading books for why that's happening but before we keep going um I just got a rugged rosary. They gave me one. Uh, and so you got to check them out. Uh, make sure that they know that uh, you got it from, that you found out about them from our podcast. Use the promo code Solomon. You get 10% off. They are really great. I don't have my script in front of me, but they said it was optional. So they're pretty cool about that. But um, they have wooden ones. They have like super rugged ones. Um, they even have like the 10 ones. So please go and check them out. They are really nice people. And um, I just really love their rosaries. I think you should check it out. Um, so we're going to move on here to the next uh, topic here, which is going to be um, our Christian. Here that um, before we dive into that clip, that there's if you look at how conservatism has moved across the spectrum in terms of becoming more and more what the Democrats used to be. Um, Just kind of like, hey, you do you and, you know, whatever. That's essentially the conservative party now. 
Whereas, you know, they used to be more fundamentalists. You know, you had Mike Pence not long ago doing a debate where he says he's pro-life because of what the Bible says. Now, if you ask people why they're pro-life, they'll say everything from natural law to the Bible to, well, I think IVF is totally fine. It's all over the map. So Ted Cruz's moment is, well, I'm going to play the, play the clip and we'll talk about it. And that leads to the third proposition that is indisputable. IVF is fully protected in law. It should be fully protected in law, and it will remain 100% fully protected in law. Every Democrat knows that. Out of 100 senators, 100 senators in this body support IVF treatments. I strongly support IVF treatments. In fact, in the state of Texas, IVF treatments are protected in law, and in fact, since 1987, Texas has mandated IVF coverage for many group health insurance plans. The Democrats know this. It's a lot of focus on the Alabama Supreme Court decision. The Alabama Supreme Court decision was not a decision striking down IVF. In fact, it was a case brought by parents seeking IVF against a clinic that had negligently cared for the embryos. It was a decision in defense of preserving IVF. But a whole lot of partisan elected officials and a whole lot of partisans in the media immediately seized on that decision to say, aha, IVF will be struck down. Well, I will say the state of Alabama acted promptly. Bright red, ruby red Alabama acted promptly to say, no, IVF is protected. Right now, today, roughly 2% of live births are brought into the world through IVF. IVF is... Okay, remember that number. Only 2%, okay? Just remember that. A wonderful gift that lets parents who want to welcome a son or daughter, a child to love, lets them welcome that child into the world. But understand why we're having a hearing on IVF. Not because there is any threat to IVF, but because the Democrats cannot defend their position on abortion. They have not convened a hearing on whether the country should adopt the Democrat position and allow partial birth abortion in all 50 states. That is their position, but it's wildly unpopular. So for any mom or dad at home looking to have a child through IVF, understand IVF is 100% protected in law. It should be. It will be. I strongly support it, and so does every other member of this body. Senator all right, so there's a lot going on in there, but there's a couple things to point out. Number one, Ted Cruz is a good politician, so you know whether or not he agrees with this morally, I don't know, but it certainly seems like if it would be a conflict of conscience for him if he wasn't in agreement with it, but also that he's part of the SBC, and so the positions on what you can do there are pretty much up to your local body um, as far as what's ethically permitted and what's not, as long as it's not blatantly a direct contradiction in scripture. And this is how a lot of Christians get around the idea of IVF is they say, well, you know, it's for a good, you know, it's technically a necessary, you know, it's, it's a challenging time. There's even, you know, when I was in seminary, I can remember learning about IVF in my ethics classes and learning about the theological conflict there. And people just, the arguments are hard for your average Christian to understand why it's wrong because number one most of them don't understand what the process actually involves um, so the family who's going through with it does the husband and wife when they decide to go through with it they do understand what is involved and then it's almost always a conflict of interest because they're going to have to decide what they're going to do with these kids you know because they're going to fertilize multiples and then they got to decide what to do if the if the first two take then they have to decide if they do two or one or whatever Whatever's left over, the embryos, they have to decide what they're going to do with those. They're either going to donate them to science, which is abortion or human experimentation, um, or they're going to abort them, or they're going to keep them on ice until whenever, which, based on what I've heard and some of the research or some of the posts that people have had on Twitter, you know, the thawing process doesn't exactly lead to um, a uh, healthy outcome for the kid. Um, so this is a definite conflict of interest theologically. It's also an indication, very similar to when the pill came out, very similar to when uh, back in the like you know 
back in the, the 1930s or whatever, I think is when the Anglican church kind of started moving towards contraception. Well, technically the Episcopal church. Um, but when, when, when Protestants are moving in the direction on uh, contraception or procreative technology, technologies, they definitely seem to think let's ask for forgiveness rather than permission. And this is what I think is important is that this means that the definition of Christianity is changing. You know, morally speaking, you know, if you've got one group over here that says, you know, um, well, we can kill kids to have kids. And the other group over here says, well, no, it's not even just that, but this is just an entirely immoral process of having a family. Well, those are two different groups. Those are two different types of Christians um, in the same way that we might say, well, yeah, in name, you know, California and the Democrats are uh, are definitely American. But at the end of the day, they're also saying that illegal uh, immigrants can vote. And so th those are essentially two different Americas. And all the polling data shows this, that there is more of a divide on what it means um, to, to be American in, in this country now, as far as like Democrats versus Republicans, probably, you know, everybody points out that it's never been this way since the Civil War, and they use that to kind of fear monger and stuff. But my point is, is that if we look at the rest of how the conservative movement has changed, this is very similar to the gay marriage debate, where it was like very small amount of people who were coming in and saying, hey, we want this right, we feel like we deserve to have marriage. And it was, you know, the stats were, well, you know, it's like one or two percent of people are gay. You know, that's that. And if we look at how many want to get married, it's even smaller. So who cares? Um, and so this is essentially kind of the same argument. It's just weird to hear it from Ted Cruz because, you know, we kind of see him as somebody who's having similar values as Christians, regardless of whether you're Catholic or Protestant. But I want to point out that this isn't just Ted Cruz. This is also um, we've also as as the GOP welcomed in. Um, conservatives that were orig or Democrats that were that are now conservative who have totally different lifestyles, totally different views. And I'm not saying that the GOP has to be uh, Christian. It's just that there's a conflict here on a, a moral level that is very difficult to reconcile politically. And so let's take a look at um, at Dave Rubin here. Who Let me just say something else on this, which is that everyone's running around. DeSantis hates gays. Blah blah. I happen to be gay. I am married to a dude. Okay. We're having kids. You know what? What showed up at my door two days ago? A package with two. We're having two babies with two baby onesies from Ron DeSantis Get and his wife. Here. Okay, he does not hate gay people. At this PragerU event that I mentioned before, I introduced. I said, uh, Governor, this is my husband, David. Big hug, smile, took a picture. Congratulations on the. Mm -hmm. This has nothing to do with an assault on gay rights. If DeSantis was saying gay people can't get married, gay people can't work, whatever the litany of stupidity that these people think, of course I would be against it. There's nothing I stand for more than equal rights for everybody. Let me just say something else on this. So, you know, again, like he's just talking about DeSantis. These are these are clips, you know, cruises from last week. This is a clip from back when uh, probably a couple months ago when DeSantis was running for for president. Um, but again, it, it begs the question, okay, well, whose rights are the, is the GOP going to defend? Because when you look at the stats, they're going to have to, they're going to have to say no to some people. That's just the facts. They're going to have to say, we're going to, we're going to prioritize this group of constituents over this group of constituents. And it's going to be based on who they think is going to be more likely to vote for them. Um, and the thing that's important here is that people are changing they're using the same terms, but they're redefining them in the same way that we, we redefined marriage. You know, marriage was just between a man and a woman. And then, you know, it, it encompassed a whole host of uh, different definitions now culturally and politically between a man and a man and a woman and a woman. And if these things continue, then we're going to find ourselves uh, seeing, you know, more and more broad definitions. And the same thing I would argue is happening with family. So DeSantis was on the campaign trail when he was running for president. And this, this all came from an article I wrote. If you want more details on, on this, this kind of issue, it was, uh, it's on my sub stack. It's, um, it will the GOP continue to fight for religious Liberty. And this was one of the clips I, I placed in there because I think it highlights the question. Okay. What do you mean by religious freedom? What kind of things are you going to defend? So let's watch this clip. 
you that, that, that we're not strong on religious liberty because the founders would have laughed that that would have ever been a case, um, that you're going and doing that. But I think it's the same mindset that uh, your right to practice your faith, and not just with Christians, Orthodox Jews and others, uh, they think that it stops the minute that it impinges on their agenda. That's why you can have a case like a 303 creative at the U.S. Supreme Court where the three liberal justices dissent, uh, and they would have supported the compelled speech. Do you think for a minute, if there was conservative compelled speech, that those three justices, liberals, would have dissented? No way. They would have been on the other side of that. And so they're basically saying that religious freedom is less as a matter of God-given right, and it's more something that the elites are allowing you to do and are tolerating you doing it, but only up into the point that it conflicts with their agenda. And that's very dangerous for society. And if you think about it, the family and faith are the building blocks of society, and those are the two areas that they're really waging an assault against right now. So at the end there, he brings it up. Religion and family are the two things that society is based on. Well, the problem is we've already redefined marriage, and now things like IVF are going to redefine family. And the reason why I think this is going to happen is because the, the, the reality is, is that family and religion go hand in hand. The state doesn't get to tell you what is it, the marriage is, is a God given institution. First and foremost, that has political benefits because the same thing that makes a church flourish or any assembly is the same thing that makes a society flourish. If the thing that you want to grow needs people, then the building block for that is family, whether that's a soccer club or whether that's a church or whether that's a nation. If you're not having kids, then you're going to be in trouble. And so people will say, well, you know, the IVF is helping people do that. Yeah, but only 2%. So so the, the question is, if only 2% of people are doing this, then why is it such a political sticking point? And I think part of it is, is that the Democrats are making it one. This is political warfare. You know, they're trying to... Well, not warfare, but, you know, they're trying to put uh, Republicans in a difficult spot because they know that IVF is a contentious issue within the party. But the bigger issue is that if, if Christians continue to do to, to be divided over some of their most basic moral convictions, like, for example, hey, you can't go through a medical procedure if it involves the killing of a child. If life really begins at conception, you know, that 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 procedure over there is kind of off limits for us. You know, you got Jehovah's Witnesses out there that won't even like get a shot. Like I know a friend of mine who literally told me, he's like, yeah, I've never gotten one because, you know, we grew up this way and, you know, whatever. So if if people out there are willing to take stands like that, you know, what does it say about, you know, us Christians, Catholics or Protestant or whatever, who say, yeah, you know, I, I, I just really, really wanted this kid. And so I, I said to I said I was going to go through this procedure, even though it violates one of God's commandments and it's not the way God intended it. And I think that this is causing Christians to end up in a difficult spot because if you're willing to just take whatever incentives society gives you, well, then your politicians are going to do the same thing. And they're technically representing you as a result. And I think that's part of the reason why Ted Cruz is doing what he's doing. His job is to be a politician. And as long as this happens then Orthodox Christians, Christians are going to begin to lose um, their political representation, their political value, because the positions we take are not going to be advantageous for politicians to take a stand on. So this, uh, this is highlighted even further by the fact that Andrew Clavin, who you know has been talked about recently because of the Candace stuff, I don't want to talk about that stuff. I want to talk about the fact that even amongst some of our most beloved conservatives, and I like Andrew Clavin a lot. I don't know him personally, but I love his show. I watch it all the time um, when I can <laughs> with all the hosts that they have. It's hard to keep up. And now that I'm doing my own podcast, it's uh, even harder. But, you know, all of us, I, I don't, you know, I'm on Twitter all the time, and I think most of his followers feel this way, that he's inconsistent about, you know, the, the LGBT issue. Um, but there's a clip from a while back, you know, it's about five years old, but it, I presume that he still holds this position, but it only highlights the fact that all of these clips that I've just showed you are from prominent conservative politicians or influencers. And the definitions that conservatives have for them, as we will find out in the next slide, um, 
do not align at all, but Democrats do. Purpose. I, I've been in the arts all my life. I know a lot of gay people. You know, a lot of gay people in my life, who I, many of whom I love, many of whom have been my friends. It seems to me that even though the center of human life is a man and a woman coming together to create children, that is at the very center of human life, there is room for life to exist outside of the center. And it seems that if you get rid of all the other sins that destroy people, the promiscuity, the infidelity, the, the hurtfulness and you know, uh, use of force and, and, uh, and betrayal, if you get rid of all of that and you're just left with two people of the same sex who love each other for life, it seems to me that their sexual urge could be subsumed into the greater good, uh, even though you're not using it for procreation. It, it can be subsumed into the greater good of your affection for one another, and I believe that the that this I believe that this is an attitude that the church needs to change, and uh, probably will change over time. It doesn't have to put uh, it doesn't have to make make uh, homosexuality a, homosexual relationships a sacrament as marriage is, because we understand that marriage is at the center of human life and is sa and is sacred in that way. Mm -hmm. But it it should start letting people have the consolation of sexual companionship if they can't have it with the opposite sex, if their natural bent is to have it with their own sex. So I, dis I disagree with him. I thought he was an eloquent and intelligent spokesman for his point of view. So, you know, I don't want to dive too much into the Aristotelian discussion that uh, on that, but it, it only highlights the fact that bottom line is, is that Clavin's position is explicitly against what the church teaches. It's explicitly against, against what the Bible teaches. Um, and we have this kind of, I'm going to pick and choose what I want out of my Christian faith. And and I think to a certain extent, that's just natural. Like, you, you know, your, your spiritual growth has to happen. Like you, you, even I'm learning stuff that, that you know, obviously, um, it, for anyone who knows any recent uh, events in, in my past, but the, the, the nature of, of, uh, of this whole uh, situation is that, Christians are not agreeing on what are moral issues, and that's primarily the political sphere, but Democrats are. And so when we look at these stats here, Their, their position is 8% say it's very bad, 11% say somewhat bad, and 23% say somewhat good. And so the, uh, and then 57% say very good. And so if we look at the, uh, the bottom here, you can see this is kind of the, the section that I, uh, I care about. If you look at Protestant and Catholic, it's kind of funny because, you know, Catholics are uh, way over here. And this is probably why Michael Knowles says he doesn't believe in uh, statistics because, you know, that definitely <laughs> makes you wonder, um, especially after the fiducia supplicans, you know, where they, uh, where they got their uh, statistics. Um, but either way, th this is, this is problematic. And so um, I'm going to highlight some things here. So you have Republicans that say 38% uh, say it's somewhat good. And 15% of Republicans say very good. And then you have 23% of Democrats say it's somewhat good and 57% say it's very good. So the thing is, is that this overlap here, and you're starting to see, I'd be curious to see this also on, on abortion because I think some of that is happening as well, is that you're seeing this breakdown in the Republican Party where it's basically split down the middle, where it's essentially a 50-50, and the Democrats are taking a significant portion of those votes especially in local elections, which is what we saw in issue one in Ohio, that like this pro-life issue comes down and, uh, you know, a lot of conservatives voted yes on issue one. Um, and so, you know, it's just a fact that if we can't even get our party in line on abortion, then, and, and we can't even get our party in line on marriage, 
then you know IVF is just another nail in the coffin. And so we're, we're running into this problem where we, it again, is no longer advantageous for us to continue um, down this down this road. And, and I have more stuff on that, but I have a listener question that I have to get to first. I just want to highlight this. We have an e-store that is coming up. We just got our new mugs in. So um, Maximilian Colby right there. Um, we also have this great quote, the most deadly poison of our times is indifference. So I do intend to give a very clear answer on exegetical versus topical preaching. Um, a Colby quote, and then uh, we also have the Souls and Eatson, and this is uh, another mug. I was drinking out of it earlier. In fact, actually, I have the, uh, the uh, Maximilian right here. Um, but this is also a great one. You know, put that on your office desk, huh? Let people know what you think about truth. The simple step of a courageous individual is not to take part in the lie. One word of truth outweighs the world. Alexander Solzhenitsyn. So um, back to the question. What do I think about, uh, what do I think about the exegetical versus topical? So this is interesting because I just became Catholic and they are much more topical and than exegetical. I personally think that uh, exegetical preaching is on its way out um, for a couple of reasons. Um, people are moving way too much. Well, there, there's two ways you can think about this. Uh, people are moving a lot. And so when I was growing up, there were a lot of pastors who would be like, we're going to take an entire three years to get through Romans. And, you know, you'd go to different churches and the pastors would be bragging about how long it's taken them to get through one book of the Bible. The problem with that is that, number one, practically speaking, in the Protestant world, it's not required that you show up on Sundays uh, as it is in the Catholic world. If you miss Mass uh, on uh, Holy Day of Obligation, which is Sundays, then, um, you know, you're in a grave sin. Um, so the idea of showing up for exegetical services in the Protestant world, the people who want to hear them are going to show up. The people who don't are just going to come and go, and it kind of defeats the purpose. I personally think that exegetical preaching would just be better if they did it in a small group, because I think that that would keep them from going, from, from giving, the goal is to get people a continuity of the book, of the Bible, but you can't really do that because people have schedules in life and they, they, you know, they can't keep up. But now with technology, what pastors I think should do is do exegetical podcasts because they could do topical sermons and exegetical podcasts. And then they have this archive of content. I, I think that if you look at where things are going, I, I think that churches need to cut back on the live streams and they need to start using podcasts as uh, kind of like the the hook to get people in. So exegetical preaching would be a great way to do that. As far as topical goes, I think that that is important. Now, God's going to use the word, whether it's preached exegetically or topical. But I do think that if order for, I, I think that it goes in phases. In times of freedom and prosperity, you know, like exegetical preaching is great. But um when you're looking at a time where Christians are going to be persecuted and, and struggling, then um, politically or even societally, um, I, I think that uh, you've got to, the, the pastor is supposed to know what his flock is going through and needs to preach accordingly. And that's going to necessarily probably require topical rather than exegetical. Um, the Catholic Church, you know, they have the, uh, the, the daily mass and they have readings and they have homilies that are based on those passages. And um, I just think that that is the better approach because it's a more unified approach when you can go into a Catholic church and you can hear the same readings, and the same passages. I think that's a really beautiful thing. Now, granted, you could go into an Anglican church, hear those things, but at the end of the day, um, they don't have to. Whereas in the Catholic church, it's expected that they're at least in line with those, uh, with those readings. So, uh, sounds a little bit indifferent, and I just wrote a quote on it. But I, I de basically my answer is, is that if I had to choose, I would choose topical because people should be doing their own Bible study and involved in the church anyway. Um, 
And so if people are coming to Sunday and that's when they're getting their primary biblical education, um, I think that is not ideal. Secondly, I also think that church is primarily for worship and not for, um, and not essentially for um, a lecture. And exegetical preaching tends to be 30 to 45 minutes long. And uh, that means that the pastor is more the centerpiece than Christ in the mass. And so, um, but again, I'm Catholic, so, you know, um, new Catholic to be sure. But uh, I, I like, I like being Catholic a lot. So hopefully that answers your question. Thank you for sending it. And if you guys have questions, make sure you send them in, drop them in the comments. I'll definitely answer them in my next podcast. All right. So moving on, uh, we're going to go back to the, uh, to So I think that this basically highlights a, a very important thing, that you are seeing people basically, especially in the conservative movement, going totally libertarian, like prepper, like, you know, I've got to be ready. Uh, you know, they're coming and, and you know, they're going to throw me in jail. They're going to throw your kids in jail, you know, and if, if that doesn't happen, society's going to co collapse and, you know, people are going to, you know, be, uh, crime's going to go up. And if you don't have yourself ready, you know, you're done. And it's not my job to be there for you. It's your job to be there. You know, this kind of libertarian attitude. In other words, this full blown, like far, far, uh, far out freedom, like basically like freedom to the point of chaos. But then on the other hand, you've got people doing some weird stuff with Trump. It just doesn't make any sense. They are, well, it does make sense based on the Tocqueville quote, but essentially what, what he said there, which was,
have somebody who is uh, out there really championing a you know orthodox view of the faith in a mainstream news outlet. Um, I mean, there there's a few like you know Matt Walsh and others might might fall into that camp, but at the end of the day, the the it's still divided because you know Andrew Clavin works for the same 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 group, and I, I think that's fine. I think it's great. Like they are an example of how people should be able to work alongside each other and have differing opinions. But my point is, is that th- this, the, the natural outcome of the liberal Christianity was to produce lukewarm Christians who ultimately were like, well, you know, I'm not as crazy as that, you know, I'm not gay, but it's okay if you're gay, you know, kind of a thing, or, you know, I, I, I would never, you know, get an abortion, but I totally understand why you would, you know, and this idea that um, having compassion for sin in the sense of the sin itself, rather than having compassion for the sinner and, and recognizing that part of that is for us to tell them, you don't have to do this sin because I'm going to help you carry the cross. I'm going to help you carry the cross that God has asked you to bear. But what Christians have done is essentially done the, you know, uh, imagine if Simon of Cyrene, who was pulled out of the crowd, said, oh, no, I'm sorry, you know, not me. I don't have time to help him with his cross. You know, good luck. You know, he's the one who helps Jesus carry his cross to Golgotha. So part of this is, is that I think that the liberal mindset was, well, you know, if we let people do what they want, then that's less of a burden on us, whether they knew it or not. But this is what, um, what, uh, uh, Clavin says about even salvation with, uh, and again, like people have, have, you know, taken this a lot of different ways, but he says basically that, you know, Ben Shapiro, it'd be bad if Ben Shapiro became a Christian. And, it, and he was speaking from the heart, but just, just listen to the clip. My friend, Ben Shapiro. And, and you know, I, und- I understand this. All, every, all of you who love Ben, and I love Ben, and Jordan Peterson, you all want to see them find Jesus because you know what joy and, and freedom that gives you. And, and you certainly feel that it alters your relationship with God. But when I think about this, to be honest with you, uh, you know, and I know some people will disagree with this, but I, life is not a game show where you guess the name of God and, and you get to go to heaven. Honk, you know, yes, the name is Jesus. Uh, I look at Ben's life and I think if, if Ben were to embrace Jesus Christ, it would cause devastation to his family, to the people who love him, to the people who listen to him, to his position in the world. I just have this feeling that God has put this guy where he wants him to do what he wants him to do. And as you know, I feel that you know, the Jews were not abandoned by God. I, I feel the same way about Jordan. So, you know, he goes on to talk about Jordan Peterson as well. And and I talked about this at length on um, earlier this week. You can, it's the most recent video on the YouTube channel and X. And so wherever you like to watch podcasts or whatever. But the main point is, is, is that again, this is a, th- there's no Christian institution that, that believes what he just said. There's not a Christian institution out there that believes what he just said. Um, in terms of an Orthodox Christian view. And this is an important distinction to make when we're talking about this stuff. People can think whatever they want because that's that's what they do. They're thinking things. They're a rational creature. It's part of the image of God in us. They're going to think what they... what they, They're going to go after their desires. They're going to go after what they perceive to be the good. They're going to try to avoid evil. But when... But where the, the sinister aspect is, is when, when the... When evil starts to look like it's it's actually the good or when when a a lie appears to be the easier path than the truth this is why jesus said narrow be the way and few there be that find it that you know at the end of the day um truth actually is the the harder route but it's the more it's it's the more uh rewarding route it's it, it's the it's the path of meaning and in that sense it's the lighter uh burden Um, and everybody, every single myth or history or tale or whatever you want to call them, they all have this theme where, you know, this guy tries to take the easier route and this guy takes the hard and slow route, but he has the meaning and he becomes what God wants him to be. And it's important to understand that, um, the significance of, of what Jesus did that intellectuals could not, uh, on this issue of, you know, uh, what political ideas were supposed to have. It, it, it was united. You know, the church was united for like 1500 years. It was tumultuous, but it was united. Um, in, 
in doctrine and in and and the issue is is that if we are not united then we are not going to be able to be represented and right now if everybody's kind of saying this thing or that thing and again the influencers are contradicting the institutions then what are politicians supposed to represent? Are they supposed to represent this group over here that says, well, hey, we think Christianity is this, like Andrew Clavin or like even even Ben Shapiro or others? Um, the, the reality is, is that it becomes very difficult for the politician to determine what's the wisest course of action because now he's being forced to choose between his own values and his own convictions versus those of representing the people that he's been elected to represent. These are challenging times. So um, Alexis. So the, the the issue, and, and we're going to talk about what what that means. Like it's it's not like you can't just say I believe in Jesus. You can't you can't just say that because Jesus said certain things. You know he 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 condemned people. He also uh, blessed people, and then he gave his apostles the power to uh, to forgive and retain sins. And then we see his gospel working out in the epistles and in the New Testament. And then over the course of a thousand years, you, you read some of church history. If you follow Joshua Charles at all, he's a great count to follow, uh, posting stuff on church history. And you realize the continuity of some of these themes that we still have today. It, it wasn't just that everybody said, you know, Jesus is a real smart guy. You know, what do you like about him? Oh, well, I really like that he says, you know, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. Yeah, but that's a hard teaching. What about what he said about that rich guy over there? That was nice, huh? Yeah, but, you know, what he said about that lady giving her money to the religious leaders, they're a bunch of corrupt people, and she gave everything she had. You know, the, the thing is, is that you by yourself cannot have a private interpretation about what Jesus is or who he said he was or whatever, no matter whether you're Catholic, whether you're Baptist, whether you're Church of Christ, whether you're uh, some offshoot of even those like Mormonism or whatever, you're you're gonna. It's not you who defines things. It's just objectively not. You are either submitting to those things, or you're going and looking for something else. the 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 human person was meant to be in community. And community is naturally hierarchical. I mean, anybody knows this who has like a get together at their house. The popular people immediately, you know, come to the fore. The people who are a little bit more uh, re reserved, you know, they kind of make their way around. But, you know, they're not as, you know, outgoing and, and these kinds of things. Everybody has known this since, you know, essentially middle school, that hierarchy just is part of the world. And it's also part of the assemblies. And assemblies are what define the rules of their communities. That's just a fact. And so no matter what you think about, you know, well, I think Jesus said this. Well, what, is, what does Clavin's church say about that? Or what does your church say about that? You know, most people are going to church either for an experience that they want to have or they're going because their friends are there. But that's not why we go to church. You know, the, Aristotle said, and Aristotle's not even a Christian, said the you know, man by nature desires to know. And... Uh, it's not enough to just know propositions and formulae. It, it, it's truth is propositional. It's also incarnate. And so we should be looking for a visible church. We should be looking for these things. And we should expect that visible church to have some sort of, you know, uh, phenomenon associated with it that uh, it, it's not just uh, another uh, political organization, right? Um, and so we... we 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 have to understand that institutions know their Bible as well as you do. Not everybody does, and um, you know, not everybody is going to have the ability to start a church. I can't believe how many people out there think that anybody can start a church. If that was the case, then why did Paul put criteria in there for leaders? Like, 
even outside of that, not everybody can, can even, you know, uh, has the, the means to do this, you know, because there are people who are poor and destitute who, who need the church to serve their needs because God has other plans for them. So this idea that anybody can, can start a church is just problematic or that anybody can, can define doctrine regardless of whether you're Catholic or Protestant or whatever, that just doesn't even line up with any of the institutions. And so the, the reason why this is important is that you're going to have to imitate, imitate Christ by submitting to authorities. Christ submitted to authorities. You're supposed to submit to authorities. That doesn't mean you have to submit, to, you know, that doesn't mean if they tell you to sin, you got to go sin. But how many times have we seen these, uh, I'm going to come back to this quote in a second. How many times have we seen that people have uh, movies or, you know, you, you watch movies about, you know, black Americans who were, you know, discriminated against in the military, but they still serve their country anyway. We know that's a noble endeavor to, to do what's right, even though it hurts to sacrifice for someone else, even though, you know, you will not benefit from the freedom. And, and we know that that is a, a virtue, but you can't do that if you aren't in an institution. And if you're only there for your friends, well, what happens when your friends turn on you? Well, you're going to leave because there's nothing objective keeping you there. There's nothing doctrinal keeping you there. And that's true whether you're Baptist, Catholic, or Anglican, or Episcopal, or, or whatever it is. If, if you're there primarily for the people and you're not there for the truth, then you're going to find yourself in a tough spot. But here's the thing. Not everybody has the ability, and Alexis de Tocqueville pointed this out uh, back in 1836. He says, Only minds freed completely from the ordinary preoccupations of life, minds of great depth and astuteness, can, with the help of ample time and attention, penetrate such vital truths. He's talking about moral and, and divine truths. Such studies are quite beyond the average human capacity, and even when the majority of men were capable of such pursuits, they clearly would not have the free time. Fixed ideas about God and human nature are vital to the daily practice of their lives, but the practice of their lives present, prevents them or prevents their acquiring such ideas. And this, this, is, this is really important because I think that people think now that because, you know, I can read or I, I can go to whatever church I want, I can live stream, whatever, that, you know, we, we are in this time where we can uh, just kind of decide for ourselves whatever Christianity is. And when I was converting to become Catholic, I had some people say to me, you know, I really like this about the Catholic Church, but I don't like that about the Catholic Church. And that, that has been probably the response that I've gotten from most of my Protestant friends. Some people are, are, are totally shocked that we are not pleased at all that we converted. Other people are, you know, more charitable saying like, yeah, the Catholics definitely get this right. You know, anyone who's read some Catholics or have been impacted by Catholics know that, you know, they're not a bunch of... Um, uh, evil people. Um, but the bottom line is, is that the reason why institutions are needed is because not everybody has the same, uh, intellectual responsibility to know doctrine there to know the truth. And, and doctrine is essentially revealed truth. That's, that's defended by reason and authority. This is the same, uh, criteria that Thomas Aquinas gives for law says it needs to be reasonable, needs to be uh, promulgated, meaning you have to know it. And then the, uh, like, you can't, like, make a law in the back of your office and say, you know, we've passed it, and now you're in trouble. That's an unjust law because uh, you can't follow what you don't know. So promulgated, reasonable, um, and it has to also have an, an authority behind it. And and there's, like, one one other one. I can't remember what it is. But but the, the bottom line is, is that... Uh, that's the same thing for doctrine is that it has to be have an authority has to be reason in accordance with reason and people have to know it and, and, and it has to be able to be enforced. Um, now the fact that it's not enforced doesn't nullify the law that just makes the authority culpable for not exercising their authority. But the, but the nature of, of doctrine is very similar to the nature of law that, you know, it, it, it has to come from an institution. Uh, and, and it's the same way with political entities too. You, you were born into this world and the way you found out about what's right and what's wrong, and what's against the law and what's, uh, what, what's following the law is because somebody came before you was given authority by the people and then they set the, set the rules. And so if, 
you have this completely and totally disconnected conservative Christian movement where some are basically worshiping Trump. The other ones are over here saying like, you know, the daily wire is a conspiracy. And then even within the daily wire, you've got influencers who are saying, well, you know, I mean, uh, gay marriage really, you know, the church really needs to get on board with that. You know, what, what we're seeing is, is the consequences of not being united on anything. And the politicians are going to prove this point as Ted Cruz already has. The, the, there's no way that if, if Ted Cruz sat down with some of the leaders in the SBC that they're going to say, you know, it's OK to it's OK for people to, you know, um, do IVF, even though that it, it eliminates children. That's a problem. It also opens up a whole host of other issues that people are not like, what about surrogacy? So so is the GOP going to say you can do IVF if you're a heterosexual couple, but you can't do it if you're a gay couple? Like, like this is a whole can of worms, and the Democrats know that this is a a dangerous political position for them, and I think that's why Ted Cruz is trying to take the stance that he's taken and why his speech was, was given the way that it was. So what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to find this, uh, the, which institution we're supposed to be a part of? And I, and I think, you know, that God ultimately is leading people into all truth. I think he wants people to be in the truth. It says he wants people to be saved. He doesn't want people... Uh, to, to go to, to go to hell. Um, so we know that God's alive and active. The problem is, is that um, whenever he's alive and active in ways that we don't want to be alive and active, we, we, we try to read our doctrine into um, those things. And so a couple of weeks ago, I talked about Tammy Peterson's um, rosary miracle. And, uh, and, you know, people would, would interpret it however they want. Um, but one thing's for sure, she's not going to the SBC for a small group to share her testimony and become a member of those churches. Uh, because just imagine for a minute, Tammy Peterson walks into your small group, your, your little Bible study, and you're like, oh, welcome, Tammy. How are you? You know, just imagine this. And uh, tell us your story. How'd you, be, how'd you become a Christian? And she starts, she, she pulls out her rosary and she says, well, I started praying this and I'm the only survivor of the cancer that I have. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just here because my friend brought me. Like everybody knows who's ever been in a Baptist or a evangelical or non-denominational small group that that's going to be a problem for the leader. It won't be a problem for the people sitting around necessarily because they'll say, oh, I know a Catholic who had the same experience. But again, it's a Catholic. And so the, the question is, is like, okay, well, where's she supposed to go? Well, anyway, um, event with a, a guy named Justin Briley. And, um, and in this, uh, oh, I'm moving my, uh, hold on just a second here. Let me get back to the, uh, the browser. There we go. Now I'm showing you what I'm seeing. So, so Justin Briley, for those that don't know, he's a, a British guy. Uh, he has a podcast. I can't remember what it is. Let me uh, see here. Uh, hosting conversations on faith, science, theology. Uh, anyway, you can find him. Justin Briley. He, he's just Briley at just Briley. Um, anyway, you can see his picture right there. Follow him if you aren't already. Um, and he does great apologetics work. Uh, I know some friends who have been on his show and, uh, he, he's just really charitable guy. And he's, I don't know, it's just, he's got a good British accent. He's fun to listen to people talk about God. It's, that's the way it goes, isn't it? You know, like I swear if I had a British accent, more people would get converted, you know, but Providence, you know, anyway, but the bottom line is he says, I was delighted to be joined recently by historian Tom Holland, and Tom Holland is not a Christian, uh, and a 600-strong audience at a recent conversation event on the surprising rebirth of belief in God, hosted by Paul Woolley and Grace Fielding of LICC. I don't know what LICC is. Um, so he goes through and he starts talking about um, his experience Tom, with Tom Holland. Tom Holland starts telling him about this. Um, and Justin Briley said, uh, Holland spoke candidly for the first time about a cancer diagnosis he received in December, 2021, which would have necessitated the removal of part of his digestive system. The news came at a time when hospitals were being overwhelmed by the Omicron, uh, spike and a clear picture of diagnosis was hard to come by reeling from the news. Holland attended a midnight mass at St. Bartholomew the great, where he prayed a desperate prayer within a couple of weeks. It appeared his prayer had been answered. A set of unusual circumstances led to the diagnosis being reversed. No surgery was needed. 
uh, says Holland. The historian freely admits that his experience are, is, experiences are unlikely to sway a hard-headed skeptic, but they've impacted him. He also admits the answered prayer story won't fit neatly into every Christian box either. The Lady Chapel at St. Bart's commemorates the only place in London where a Marian apparition is purported to have occurred. Holland says that his desperate prayer was directed towards the Virgin Mary. Holland says he was surprised as anyone that this was the circumstance to persuade him Christianity might be true. God must have a sense of humor, he laughed. It was one of many memorable moments that evening. And uh, I believe it's up on YouTube now. And so you can check that out. Um, the, the reason why I think that this is uh, an important piece is because, you know, a lot of people look at the denominations and stuff, and it's confusing initially. Russell Brand even said so, um, as he's discerning as well. And if you grew up Protestant, there's a good chance that in this age of the internet, you're trying to figure out what you believe, and you're trying to figure out what you're supposed to come down on, and you probably feel like, you know, you got to figure it all out. And this is the impetus, I think, largely for why guys go to seminaries, because there is this sense that they need to know more in order to be um, the, the in order to serve the church properly. And um, and so th- and that's true. Like you need leaders to be informed, you know, a leader who can't read probably can't, you know, uh, lead very well. Um, but the the issue is, is that the way that Jesus became known, because to everybody else, he looked like just a man. And the miracles he gave were miracles that were very, very relevant to um, the people that he was working with, resurrecting people from the dead, for example, like Lazarus. Um, you know, poor Lazarus, he gets resurrected. We were just reading the other day, and, you know, the the people wanted to come for Jesus, and they wanted to kill Lazarus too. Like, man, like, you die, then you're raised again, you're hanging out with Jesus and you get word, Hey, they're coming to kill you. Like that's, that's the world that these miracles are happening in. But the thing is, is that if, if most people in the world, you know, nowadays, and I'm surprised at, you know, how much more amicable the relationships between Catholics and Protestants are, you know, um, being in the trenches together, I think is making people realize they have more in common than, than they don't, but they still do have differences, substantial differences. And Mary is one of them. And I just want to put this thought experiment to you. You know, if, if most people's hang up is, well, they worship Mary and then Mary starts answering prayers of intercession for people and they're getting healed and it's all over the internet on their own personal YouTube channels, their doctors are validating this. You're able to watch this in real time, like with Tammy Peterson If you're a fan of Tom Holland, you you probably learned some stuff from him or picked up on tidbits just like we did with the Peterson family where Jordan Peterson would give an update about how she was doing and and people would feel like, wow, like, man, his wife is really sick and people were praying for her. And, you know, and so the thing is, is that imagine how the Petersons feel. There's all these different, I mean, Jordan Peterson has had Muslims reach out to him and say, I've become, I've gone back to, to, to my mosque. I've, I've reconnected with my faith. That's got to be really confusing. Like, which one do you pick? You know, like if you, if you're really starting to feel like you need to be baptized or you need to go to church or you need to do these things. And then your wife has a, a Marian miracle. That that's kind of narrows the field a little bit, doesn't it? And so the, the thing is, is that if, where, where, what? How many churches do you think? Just you know, say it in the comments. Like, how many churches do you think that people know about? Okay, I'm not talking about you know. Well, I I'm out in the country and we 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 say hail marys all the time at our Baptist church. It's like no no, that's because nobody knows about that. And if they did, it shut you down. Um, or you know, like you know, an Anglican church, an Anglo Catholic church, or whatever. You know, because even within the ACNA, there's there's not that many that do that. But as an institution, not this parish or that particular church or this particular location, but as an institution, how many institutions have a reverence for Mary, a veneration for Mary, or believe that she is the the immaculately conceived and, and, and actually intercedes on our behalf? 
How many? Not very many. And so it's, it's really interesting that we are living in a time where these influencers are having these, you know, what these experiences that they have to credit with Catholic doctrine. And somebody said, well, you know, we still believe that it's, it's God that does it. Well, yeah, Catholics do too. Catholics believe that, you know, the healing comes ultimately from God, but in the same way that, that God worked through the apostles, you know, there's nothing to say that God can't work through the apostles in heaven. If anything, there's probably a higher chance because there's more faith up there, you know? So, I mean, Jesus himself said that he couldn't do miracles in a place because there wasn't as much faith. So if, if you're closer to God, there's nothing logically saying, speaking that God, that says God couldn't work through the saints up in heaven. And if there's an institution that says that they do, well, we would expect, okay, well, you know, there's nothing wrong with saying, all right, well, prove it. Oh, well, Tammy Peterson. Oh, well, well, that's weird, but you know, that's not enough. Or Tom Holland. Okay, well, you know, may, maybe, but, you know, it could have been anything. Well, yeah, the skeptics are saying that. That's why Tom Holland said that he doesn't think that the skeptics uh, are going to agree with him, and he's a skeptic. So what's he supposed to do? Well, he can either walk away or he can keep going. But this is why I think it's really interesting, because Alexis de Tocqueville, again, America's philosopher, and this is where we're going to end, he had a quote and a prediction and uh, he had a lot of them. And if you haven't read America, uh, Democracy in America, there are tons of them. He famously, well, most people don't even know this, but he predicted in 1836, he has a quote where he says, I believe that half of the world's population will, uh, that, that the fate of half the world will eventually find itself in the hands of the United States and Russia at some later date that Providence has ordained. He says that America lives by the, by the, by the plow and Russia by the sword. And that based on where their trajectory is, they are going to end up being the two most powerful countries in the world, and they will hold the fate of half the world in their hands. That's his quote, 1836. Those quotes are all over the place. Um, but he also has an incredible insight into the American psyche and its religious psyche specifically. And so he, he writes this, which I think is, is, is very relevant to our times. Um. He says, one of the commonest weaknesses of human intelligence is the wish to reconcile opposing principles and to purchase harmony at the expense of logic. Therefore, there have always been and there always will be men who, after submitting a certain number of their religious beliefs to a single authority, will seek to exempt several others and will let their minds hover at random between obedience and freedom. He goes on. And so this is, this is an important um, point, obviously, because just go on Twitter. Like, I mean, Catholic Twitter is some solid godly people out there. And, um, and you know, you got, your, you got your bad bagels in there like every other group. But if, if you look at who's just throwing memes and, and old school stuff, yeah, I know Protestants have good ones. You know, Gavin Ortland did a great job with, with Trent Horn. I thought he had a good debate, thought he represented his position well. But, but the problem is, is that if you talk to Protestants uh, on a lot of these issues, most of them do not know what it means with Sola Scriptura, and, and they kind of mess it up. But if you talk to a Catholic about contraception, they all know that they're not supposed to do that. They all know it. We all know it. We knew it as Protestants. Um, and so the thing that I think is, is important for people to remember here is that there's a, there's a quote from... Uh, Father Walter Chiswick in, in the book, uh, He Leadeth Me. And I don't have this one for the slide, so I'm just going to read it here. Um, it was kind of impromptu. He, he said, you know, God in his providence does not leave men at peace until they are converted in a crisis that sooner or later must come to every heart. Sooner or later, a man must learn that this changing and unstable world cannot be the source of his security, of true peace of heart. Seek first the kingdom of God, says the Lord, and all these things will be added to you. Our primary responsibility then, the main object, uh, objective of all our efforts, must be the transformation of ourselves, of our hearts, and of our lives. And he, he concludes this with, 
uh, a question, you know, like, well, why are we here? Like, you know, what, what, what's the purpose of, uh, of us being here at this time? I mean, the bottom line is, is that there is, there is no way that this is just going to turn around. And we're going to go back to like, you know, the good old days where, you know, Hey, did you hear what happened on way FM? Oh, I've never heard of way FM. You should listen to it. Wow. That's a great Christian radio station. I didn't even know Christian music was around. The bottom line is, is that the, the, the American church is fracturing morally and spiritually. And it's really easy to get depressed. I have, I have a friend who always, whenever I'm talking about this stuff, always says, well, if it's as bad as you say it is, then, what hope do we have? The hope that we have is that our suffering as Christians is not meaningless. In fact, it's it's even secular authors like Viktor Frankl said suffering is a gift. Christ calls us to carry a cross because it's redemptive. Suffering has a redemptive element to it. It it is God's chisel in our lives because whether your life is good right now or it's 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 a horrible mess everybody's going to be there. Everybody's going to be there at some point. And so the question is, what are you doing to prepare for that moment? What kind of things are you doing? Are you getting despairing? Are you choosing to let social media just ruin your day? Leaving you, do your kids see you more on your phone than they do uh, paying attention to what they've done during the day? The nature of what is happening in our, in our time is unprecedented in America in terms of, you know, the scope and the breadth at which it could really come down on Christians. There's just no question about that. And everybody feels it. And if anybody doesn't believe me, just go on LinkedIn and say, a man is a man and a woman is a woman and it can't ever be swapped. And immediately people will say, well, that'd just be dumb. Well, yeah, that tells you that we're in a pretty dark time because if, you know, we're not talking about religious persecution, we're just talking about persecution of the truth, truth that everybody knows. As Solzhenitsyn said, they're lying, we know they're lying, they know that we know they're lying, and everybody's lying. So the question is, are we going to listen to our own personal stuff? Or are we going to look at where God is actually moving, and are we going to follow him wherever he leads? And are we going to trust that whether that suffering comes from outside the church or from within the church, that we're going to trust that truth is ultimately what we're after? And that truth is present in his church and also active in our lives. And like Father Chizik said, we might despair, but yet in God's providence, here we are. So I don't have anything else to say. If you have any comments, like the show, don't forget to subscribe. I'm Daniel Roberts. Don't forget, keep thinking.